You're listening to Bible Truth Feed, a podcast by Christadelphianvideo.org for Christadelphians and all those seeking the truth about the Bible message. Join us now as we present our latest episode. Climate change and the Christian, it turns out, is quite a topical subject, isn't it? Um, given the weather that we've experienced over the, uh, the last um, few weeks. Um, with hot weather, record temperatures um, in, in this country and much of Europe, and uh, drought, wildfires breaking out, um, and, uh, and, and there's been much in our media um, about our changing climate and uh, the causes of it and, and the potential solutions uh, for it. And that's actually the first point that I'd like to, to address. Um, and that is, you know, Christian attitudes, our attitudes, uh, to views expressed in the media um, that are presented as a consensus and as, as things that are assumed to be true um, and, and to represent a consensus. Um, so let's think about that first of all, because as Christians, it often feels like we're, we're pushing against the prevailing consensus views um, and actually rejecting the consensus view. For example, you know, generally in society, in the media, it's presented as there is no God, probably. That's, that's kind of, it's assumed that most people are of that view in, in Western society, that there, there is probably no God. Um, and that's what comes across in, in the media presentation of things things religious. Um, and as Christians, we very much hold a different worldview from that. And, and, and we would believe that the existence of an all-powerful, intelligent creator uh, is the best explanation for the way the universe is, the way human beings are and the way we are, our um, sense of morality and so on. That's a whole different subject that we won't go into. But we push back against that general consensus that comes from, uh, from the media um, and, and is so prevalent and assumed that that's what most people think. And, and it's a similar with that point, isn't it? That life began by chance. Um, and, and everything is, is here in the way it is purely by chance. Uh, and again, we don't believe that's the case as Christians. Um, and, and we push back against that prevailing view coming from the media and from society and from the culture around us. Um, so I suppose the question is, should that always um, be the case? Um, because now we're considering this third view that is, is, is the prevailing view now uh, in the media. The climate around us is changing and human activity is the cause of that change. But I, I hope you can see the difference between those first two um, propositions and, and the third one. You know, those first two are very much about worldviews, things that science can't really, you know, and, and scientists will acknowledge. Science is it's not within the scope of science to say, is there a God or is there not a God? Um, and the beginning of life is, you know, you're talking about distant, the distant past, there's no observations of it. Whereas that third proposition is very much about something happening now, something that can be observed uh, and measured and, and causes um, identified. And so just because there are views that come out from the media and the culture and society around us as a prevailing view that we push back on and would consider to be wrong, that doesn't mean that everything is wrong. We have to be discerning. Um, we have to consider the evidence, and that's a very scriptural um, notion that, that we should consider the evidence, that we should test everything and hold fast to that which is good, uh, as Paul wrote to the Thessalonians. And as James wrote, the wisdom that is from above is first pure, peaceable, gentle, open to reason, impartial and sincere. So that's the way we want to, to look at this, this subject. Um, one of the aspects of the world in which we live, um, the environment in which we live, which, which we marvel at, which is astonishing, it amazes us, um, and that is how finely tuned and balanced the, the world in which we live 
is and, and how suitable for complex creatures such as human beings to, to exist and come to a hall and think complex thoughts about climate change and Christianity and God and, and so on. Um, we marvel at the balance um, in, in whether it's the moon, the size of the moon, its distance from the earth, our distance of the planet from the sun and how finely balanced that is and how that influences the tides, the oceans, the, you know, the proportion of the surface of the earth that is ocean rather than land is critical. And there's this important cycle of respiration and photosynthesis, the carbon cycle where uh, animals uh, breathe in oxygen and breathe out carbon dioxide, plants um, breathe in carbon dioxide and give out oxygen. And there's this balanced system in our environment. But it's also a dynamic system. It's able to, to change and adapt over time. Um, and, and when things change, to find new balances and new equilibriums, it's just astonishing. And, you know, even species are able to adapt at a micro level to changes in their, in their environment. Um, and we just want to make a point about the importance of balance in environmental and climate systems and, and what might lead to a tipping point that puts things out of balance. And I shall demonstrate that with Lego. So here we have uh, a balance, um, which is nicely balanced with the same, same number of pieces of Lego on either side. Um, and if I just put one more piece of Lego on one side, like that, it's sort of out of balance, but it's quite easy to find a new balance. So a small change, and, and the system will find, find a new balance. Um, and I can put another one on. Uh, and it's out of balance, but it's quite easy for it to just move and find a new balance, okay? But if I um, put a partly formed police van on the side, it, it's too much for the system to adjust and get to a new position of balance. It's, it's too much too quickly, too much change happening too quickly um, that for the system to find a new balance, a new equilibrium. That's a, a tipping point has been reached, that, that means things end up changing much more quickly, much more dramatically. There's an accelerated change um, to find, to find a, a much, much different equilibrium. So just, just, just register that thought as we, uh, as we go, go forward. Because what, what I'm going to do, essentially, is examine three, um, three perspectives that, that a, a Christian might take. To the, to the issue of climate change um, and, and just think about them and then we'll draw our conclusions at the end. So those three perspectives are, one, it's fake news. It's not happening. And even if it is happening, it's not caused by humans, not caused by human activity. So that's one perspective. And that's sort of, there's so much that as Christians we reject that comes out of the media. This, we'll just reject everything. This, and, and this is, um, this is just fake news. So that's one perspective. We'll, we'll think about that. Second one is we're all going to heaven, so it doesn't matter. Okay? And the third perspective is Jesus is coming to fix it, so it doesn't matter. So we're going to consider those three. So first of all, this, this, this view, it's, it's fake news. Uh, it's not happening, or humans aren't causing it. So first of all, that it's not happening perspective is, is relatively straightforward to, to counter, I would say, um, just by looking at the measurements of surface temperatures uh, on the globe. That's with thermometers. It's not hard to do. Um, and records have been kept since the middle of the 19th century um, that clearly show an increase in surface temperatures uh, on, on the globe of whether it's annual, the, the, the gray line at the top there is the annual measurements, annual average, and then the darker line is a five-year smoothed line, and the trend is very clearly upwards. That goes through to about 2010, and it shows a 0.6 of a degree increase. When you get to 2020, it's gone up to, I'll show you a 
the observations on that uh, in a moment, it's gone up to 1.1 degree warmer than the mid 19th century on average. Um, and the bottom graph is the change in ocean temperatures um, just from 1955 or so uh, through to 2010. You know, a, again, an increase. So temperatures are increasing. And the sorts of things that you would expect to happen to be a manifestation of increases in um, temperature uh, are also evident. So top left is the size, the average length of glaciers, glaciers, I'm quite sure which it is, glaciers. Um, and as you can see, it's, it's coming down from 1850 to 2000, um, reducing length of glaciers. Um, top right, change in sea ice in the Arctic, it's coming down. This one on the bottom left is the ice lost in Greenland, the change in the mass of the Greenland ice sheet. Um, so it's an accelerating amount of ice is lost each year. And the bottom right is the change in sea level. So change, sea level has risen by about 20 centimetres from 1880 to 2000. Fairly significant. So, so those, those kind of effects that you'd expect to see with rising temperatures are also measured uh, and, and seen. Um, and th this is um, some further graphs. There are lots of graphs in there. I know some people say graphs, but you know, try not to judge me for it. There's lots of graphs. So um, the one on the left there is, is the temperature, um, average temperature, global temperature, surface temperature from um, the time of Jesus to today from year zero to 2020. And 1850 to 2020 is ob observed, so that's, that's, we've got measurements, and there's reconstructions of the temperature going back to the first century from tree rings and ice cores and data like that. So you can see there's, it generally follows a, um, an, an even pattern, even getting cooler in the 1600s, 1700s, there's a little period there called the Little Ice Age. You know those pictures of when the Thames freezes over and people are skating on the Thames? There was that Little Ice Age for um, a, a period there. Um, but then 1850, and you can see how dramatic that rise is, 1850 to 2020, um, the 1.1 degree rise from 1850 to 2020. Now the graph on the right-hand side um, is interesting. It just takes that 1850 to 2020 period, um, but it compares, a, and it's a simulation, so let's, you know, say, state it for what it is. It's a simulation of the temperature change that would have, um, so this, this bit here that comes through in kind of pale blue is a simulation of the effect of only natural forces. So the sun's brightness, changes in the sun's brightness, volcanic activity, changes in the Earth's orbit. There are two or three different factors that, change, that affect global temperature. And simulating those, it stays pretty much the same. But then adding in human activity, is, it then tracks the actual observed um, temperature rise. So that starts to get us into the question of, is this caused by human activity? Is that temperature rise caused by human activity? Um, and I'm sure you're familiar with the greenhouse effect, that concept um, in which energy from the sun hits the earth, comes to the earth, um, enters the atmosphere. Some of it bounces out and, and is reflected off back into space. Some of it stays in the atmosphere and sort of bounces around um, as trapped heat. And the more CO2, the more carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gases there are in the atmosphere, the more of the sun's energy is retained in the atmosphere. The atmosphere becomes like a warm blanket for, for the Earth. Um, and Venus is an example. Venus' atmosphere is almost entirely carbon dioxide, and it's super hot on the, on the, the surface. All of the sun's energy gets trapped in there, um, and, it's, and it's really hot. So that's, that's the greenhouse effect. And so, you know, this human activity is all about the emission of, of carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gases. This same intergovernmental um, panel on climate change um, have uh, done some work to attribute this change, this 1.1 degree change, uh, what can it be attributed to? 
Um, and here on the left, this, this section here, so this shows the human influence on the temperature. Um, this is from the greenhouse gases, and there's some other gases that uh, in the atmosphere which cause some cooling, sulfur dioxide, uh, but it has other bad, bad effects like acid rain. And then there's solar and volcanic activity um, and other variations which almost have no effect. Um, and then it breaks it down by carbon dioxide is the main greenhouse gas, methane is, is the other one there. But that, that seems pretty clear, that, those, that human activity um, is, is, uh, can be attributed to that, that temperature rise. Um, but is, that, is, it, is it all about human activity? Is, is that all about human activity? That's the question to get to. Um, and just remember that point about balance. You know, slow, gradual changes and the system can find a new balance and, and things are okay. But if something happens quickly, there's, there's a rapid change, um, then it leads to a tipping point being reached um, in which change happens much more dramatically. So the top graph there, more graphs, um, the top graph there is population, the world population. So 1850, it's about a billion. Um, now it's 7.6, getting on for 8 billion. Um, an exponential growth since 1850 in, in population. So that's one measure of human activity. Um, the graph below that is GDP, gross domestic product, over the same period, 1850. Again, exponential growth. So, you know, that's a reasonable measure of human activity and output, if you like, production. And when you look at energy consumption, so there's energy consumption uh, from 1850, down here, uh, 2020, uh, you can see the difference. This is coal, oil, gas, and then other uh, energy consumption. Again, an exponential increase. And almost any measure that you look at has this exponential increase in activity, human impact and activity over kind of 1850 through to today. So bottom left is um, passenger kilometers. Uh, that's from uh, 1950 onwards, actually this massive rise, and this one on the bottom right is car production. It's not cars actually out there on the road, it's just cars produced. Um, it looks even worse if, uh, if it's cars out, out there on the roads. And every other, you know, whether it's tropical forest loss or growth in, this is a weird one, growth in large dams, exponential growth, farming, mining, um, pollution, water usage, Fertilizer production, paper use, all, all, any measure you look at, and there's this exponential activity growth since 1850 to, to today. So much so that geologists now are, are calling the current period the Anthropocene period because of the, you know, humanity as a planet force, a planet scale force, um, and we're leaving a mark on the planet that will last for, for, for generations. So, so just so think about those graphs. That you know, that's rapid change. That's the the police van landing on the on the balance, as it were, in that period. And it all sort of kicks off from about 1950. 1950, um, after the Second World War, 1950. That's energy consumption. And if we just go back to that that graph, that's where it starts to diverge, isn't it? 1950, the the temperature starts to rise. So, so that, that's why the IPCC, can, you know, this is their conclusion of their sixth assessment in 2020. It is extremely likely that human influence has been the dominant cause of the observed warming since the mid 20th century. Extremely likely means 95% likely. Dominant means more than half of the, of the cause. Uh, mid 20th century, that's obviously from 1950, 1960. So just before we move, so that, that I think deals with that first possible perspective. You know, it's not happening, it's not caused by humans. There, there's abundant evidence, really, that that is the situation that's, that's developed in, over the last uh, half century and, or more. Um, but just perhaps to give a sense of where we are in this situation, this problem, um, the 
people talk about, you know, we want to limit the temperature increase to two degrees. And because if, if you go much above that, I mean, even with that, there are significant impacts around flooding and, and droughts and fires and so on, wildfires um, and, uh, and, you know, extreme weather events. Um, so, but limit it to two degrees and, and we'll more or less be okay. The amount of carbon dioxide that there can be in the atmosphere to limit the temperature increase to two degrees is estimated at 3,000 billion tonnes, three gigatons of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. And it's a fixed amount. If, if there's less than that, it'll be a less than two degree. If it's more than that, it'll be more than two degree. It's a, you know, it's a, there's, there's a fixed budget of carbon that we can stick in the atmosphere and, and keep the change to, to within a certain level. So where have we got to? How much have we stuck in the atmosphere? Well, from 1870 to 2011, we used up 67% of that allowance. That's the yellow, the yellow one, uh, to 2011. Uh, 2012 to 2017, the next five years, we used up another 8%. So there's 24.6% left, and we're, which is 730 gigatons. And we're putting out, at the moment, about 40 billion. 40,000 billion, sorry, 41 billion tons, 41 megatons, gigatons um, of carbon dioxide every year. So you can kind of do the maths and say it's not many years before we've, we've put three gigatons of carbon dioxide into the atmosphere and the, the chances of keeping the temperature change to less than two degrees um, have kind of gone. So, so I think with, with that, I, I think as Christians, I don't think we should be in the business of denying that this is happening. Um, that's not really true to that principle that we set at the beginning, to test everything um, and to be reasonable, impartial and, and sincere. You know, this is God's earth, God's creation. Let's sincerely, um, open-mindedly see what's happening to it. So... So let's move on to how, how else we might think about the issue. And that second perspective was, we're all going to heaven. So it doesn't matter. Um, the earth is not our final destination. Um, we're going to heaven, so it doesn't matter. We can burn up and destroy, use the resources on earth. Um, now, I'm afraid there's no other way to say it, but that perspective is simply wrong. Okay, it's simply a wrong perception of what the hope of the Bible is. The Bible is not all about that. Um, the hope of the Bible is all about the earth. And, and I'll just use some passages to illustrate that. I'll put them on the screen. So Isaiah chapter 2. Um, I'll put them on the screen, but I'll, I'll read, it, read a, a few more words around them. So Isaiah 2, verse 1 to 4. Um, I'm reading from verse 2, it shall come to pass in the latter days that the mountain of the house of the Lord shall be established as the highest of the mountains and shall be lifted up above the hills and all the nations shall flow to it and many people shall come and say, come let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob, that he may teach us his ways, that we may walk in his paths, for out of Zion shall go the law and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. He shall judge between the nations and shall decide disputes for many peoples. They shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nation shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war any more. So it's a description of this future age. It's all about nations, it's about peoples, it's about um, people living on earth in, in peace. It's all about the earth. And that's from the Old Testament, and it's the same when we go to the New Testament. So in, in, in the book of Revelation, right at the end um, of the New Testament, chapter 5 um, and verse 9, we read, And they, that is the redeemed, uh, they sang a new song, saying, Worthy are you to take the scroll and to open its seals, for you were slain, and by your blood you ransomed people for God, from every tribe and language and people and nation. And you have made them a kingdom and priests to our God, and they shall reign on the earth. It's, it's all about the earth. And actually the Bible gives the, the, the negative, confirms that in the negative by saying, 
You know, Jesus, for example, in his conversation with Nicodemus says, no one has ascended into heaven. And uh, the Apostle Peter's speech on the day of Pentecost in Jerusalem, he quotes the example of David and he said, even David, one of the most faithful men, man after God's own heart, did not ascend into the heavens. And so that view about, you know, our hope is somewhere else other than the earth is just, is just wrong. It's not biblical. And actually that's pretty openly acknowledged by many mainstream theologians. So I'll just, two examples. Um, uh, N.T. Wright, who's, uh, who's now professor of New Testament at St. Andrews University, um, he's, he said, he's quoted as saying, our culture is so fixated on dying and going to heaven when the whole scripture is about heaven coming to earth. Uh, is what he says. And um, another quote from Tim Mackey, the co-founder of the Bible Project, um, he says, many of us grew up believing that heaven and earth were ways of talking about this life and the next life. That isn't the story of the Bible. The story of the Bible is that God and man are separated and that God's mission is to be with his people to bring heaven to earth. So that's, it, it's, that's, that's picking up very much what what the Bible, Bible says. So, so that perspective, we're all going to heaven and it doesn't matter what we do with the earth and burning the resources, is quite frankly just wrong. So let's move on to the third perspective, um, which was that Jesus is coming, Jesus is returning. Heaven coming to earth, Jesus is returning um, and he will fix it. So it doesn't matter. It's kind of reaching a similar conclusion. We can, we can burn it up, and, and, but it doesn't matter because Jesus is coming to fix it. And while it's absolutely true that the bringing of heaven to earth, as those two theologians um, stated it, in the kingdom of God being established on earth under the rulership of Jesus as king, that will restore the earth. We read a chapter from Isaiah that, that talked about that, and there's the opening words from that chapter the wilderness and the dry land shall be glad the desert shall rejoice and blossom like the crocus it shall blossom abundantly and rejoice with joy and singing the glory of lebanon shall be given to it the majesty of carmel and sharon they shall see the glory of the lord the majesty of our god so while it's true absolutely true that that is the hope presented by the bible to conclude that our impact on the climate doesn't matter seems to me to ignore two really important biblical principles and we'll just briefly explain those um, and the first first is this that God is the creator of this earth on which we live that in Isaiah 45 for example verse 18 we read thus says the Lord who created the heavens he is God who formed the earth and made it. He established it. He did not create it empty. He formed it to be inhabited. I am the Lord and there is no other. So confirms the point we've just made about the Bible's all about the earth um, and the, the reward of, on, on the earth. But it's, you know, God is the creator and he, doesn't, he hasn't created it just to be burned up, just to be emptied. Um, he's formed it to be a habitation to be inhabited and the other verse which we, I won't read out but just talks about the prospect of the earth being filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord God has created this earth um, in all its magnificence to be inhabited and to be filled with his glory to reflect his glory to be a reflection of the glory of God so that's one principle that I think doesn't sit well with an attitude of Jesus is coming to fix it so we can burn it up. Um, the second one is, is humanity's role created by God. Um, and for this, we go back to um, the seedbed of the Bible in Genesis, Genesis chapter 1, um, in which we read about the creation of, of humanity, of man. In Genesis chapter 1, verse 26, we read, then God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over the livestock and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps 
on the earth. And so, you know, man, humanity, mankind is created in the image of God to reflect God um, and, and, if, and to give him dominion over all the created things um, to, to be in God's, to be God's representative, if you like, to be in God's place in stewarding, nurturing, and, and having dominion over all, all created things in, in God's stead. And, and that similar point comes out in the second chapter of Genesis, when it talks about Adam and Eve being created, and they're placed in a garden. And in chapter 2 and verse 15, they're placed there. He took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to work it and to keep it, to, to nurture it, to be a steward of that, of that garden. That's kind of on a small scale, whereas chapter 1 was uh, on, on the grand uh, kind of global scale. Um, so so that, that's the, the purpose of humanity. You, know, as you, you only read, need to read one more chapter and you find man uh, falling from that. Um, but even in later parts of the Bible, like the law of Moses, there are provisions for sustainable use of the earth's resources, like uh, letting the land uh, go fallow for, for a year, one year every, every seven. And so those principles that come, come out of Scripture don't, don't sit well with thinking of, of you know, the humanity's impact on the earth, its resources, our environment and the climate as, as just being something we can, we can do and use up and burn up and, uh, and Jesus will come and fix it. There is a role for, there is a, a purpose in humanity for stewarding and keeping, nurturing um, the God's creation. So I think we should probably draw to a close. Um, so conclusions that I would, I would take from what we've looked at for, for Christians uh, in, in the context of this issue of climate change. The first one is, is to seek to understand Jesus and the true hope of the gospel. Because if you have a view that is not reflective of that true biblical hope of the gospel, then it may well lead you to an unhelpful view of, of of the issue of climate change, as we saw with the going to heaven um, idea. And seek to understand Jesus and the, the true hope of the gospel. Secondly, there are things we can do as individuals to take responsibility for our individual and personal stewardship of the earth's resources that, that, that are available to us. But the, second, the, the third point, rather, is to hope and wait for Jesus as king. I suppose that leaves us with the question, well, what does that second point really mean? What does taking personal responsibility for our stewardship of, of, of the resources of the earth that we have at our disposal? I, there's, there's, no, there's no teaching directly in scripture about what to do about climate change, clearly. But there is something in, in what, a couple of things that Jesus said that might, might help. And it's to do with what he said about um, poverty, looking after the poor. So in, in Matthew 19, Jesus has a conversation with a rich man, and he tells him, sell all your possessions and give it all to the poor. And, and so, you know, Jesus is very clear that we should have concern for, um, for, for the poor and, and do, do what we can. But he says a few chapters later, that in the incident when a, um, a woman breaks a, a jar of ointment and anoints his feet, um, there's a very expensive thing that's just poured away like that, and people complain, well, we could have sold that and given the money to the poor. And he says, the poor you will always have with you. And so there is an acknowledgement by Jesus that, yes, you should do what you can for the poor, but you're not, as humans, as mortals, going to be able to fix it completely. That won't be fixed until Jesus returns as king. And it's a similar idea, I think, we can apply to you know, climate. Yes, we can do what we have opportunity and capability to do in our, in our lives. But it's a matter of, you know, and some people have more opportunity and more capability and, and maybe more motivation to, 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 to do what they can. But it's a matter of Christian conscience guided by those scriptural principles that 
God wants his earth to be filled with his glory, and ultimately his purpose is for humans to reflect his image in their stewardship of it. So knowing those principles, um, but also knowing that as mortal human beings, we will not solve the problem, just as poverty will not be eradicated until Jesus returns to rule as king over a restored earth. Thank you. Thank you for joining us. We hope you found the episode helpful. Don't forget, most of these episodes are also available as videos on our video channel, cdvideo.org. So head over and take a look. If you have any comments or questions or suggestions, please get in touch or leave us a voice message. We love to hear your feedback. You can email us at bt f at cdvideo.org if you enjoyed the episode then please share it with others until next time may god bless you in your studies and your walk towards god's kingdom amen